Okay, uh, greetings. So, welcome to uh, today's lecture. So, we are going to start with uh, breaking from today's class. So, till now, uh, if you have a quick uh, recap of what we have done, we have looked at the powertrain. So, we looked at the uh, internal combustion engine and then like we looked at the uh, transmission. Uh, so, if you look at the powertrain, the powertrain essentially converts chemical energy into heat energy in the IC engine and then heat energy is then converted to kinetic energy in the engine and that kinetic energy is uh, transmitted to the wheels and then like used to propel the vehicle. So, in a broad sense if you look at the energy pro uh, conversion mechanism from chemical to thermal to kinetic that is what is happening in the conventional powertrain that we have learnt. Braking in a certain sense is just the complement of uh, what happens in a powertrain and what we are going to learn we will encounter other types uh, of uh, braking we are going to learn uh, what is called as friction braking that is going to be the scope of our study we will see what uh, friction braking is. So, what happens in friction braking is that like kinetic energy of the vehicle uh, is converted to thermal energy and dissipated to the atmosphere. So, that is what happens in uh, friction braking. So, in a certain sense in a, in an power train you know like you have chemical to thermal to kinetic here you have kinetic energy converted to thermal energy and dissipated to the atmosphere. So, we can see that it, it performs the complementary uh, operation right uh, as far as a friction breakers is uh, uh, concerned. So, in this uh, discussion on braking we are going to uh, look at once again how a brake is uh, constituted in other words you know we are going to look at the various components that make up the brake system. We are also going to look at how a typical vehicle brake system operates and we are also going to look at analy analyzing the uh, braking process and brake system itself. So, that is going to be the broad uh, outline of this module, but before we go to the discussion on braking just to give a perspective of what we are talking about right. So, before uh, even we do this calculation let us say you know like if someone asks you know like which is more powerful right the IC engine or the brakes for most of us you know like we see the IC engine you know like and we can feel the IC engine right in a vehicle. So, it, it you, you hear the sound right you cl go closer to the place where the engine is mounted it radiates heat energy and it appears to be bulky so many components and it we feel that it is powerful right. On the other hand brakes are some things which we hardly see right. So, they are hidden from our view in the wheel hub typically and they quietly go about doing their operation. So, at first glance we see we seem to have a very clear answer on which is more powerful, but let us see what is the uh, actual uh, scenario ok. So, let us say we consider a vehicle of mass 10,000 kilograms. Let us see I, I am just taking round numbers so that like our calculations uh, become easy right. So, first uh, let us look at the powertrain. So, we are going to do a very very simple preliminary analysis of the uh, numbers involved. So, let us say we have the vehicle going from 0 kilometers per hour to 72 kilometers per hour let us say in 20 seconds right. So, 72 kilometers per hour is 20 meters per second that is why I am just taking round numbers to help us with our calculations. So, this implies that the average acceleration is going to be what 20 meters per second 
minus 0 meters per second divided by 20 seconds. So, that is going to be around 1 meters per second square. <coughs> right, that is the average acceleration that the vehicle is going to have. Right, as I told, very, very simple calculation. Now, if I want to calculate, let us say, what is the acceleration power? Once again, we are not going to go into too many details here, but what I am going to do is that, like from a macroscopic viewpoint. We take the initial kinetic energy of the vehicle, the final kinetic energy of the vehicle, subtract the two that is the change in energy and the rate of change of energy right, will give me this quantity right is it not right. So, that is what we are going to do. So, essentially we are going to do half m V f squared minus V i squared divided by delta t. So, this is going to give us half times uh, 10,000 kilograms times 20 square minus uh, 0 square divided by 20 seconds. Of course, this unit becomes meter square per second square. So, if we uh, uh, process this right, what uh, we are going to get is 100 kilowatts right. I hope my calculation is correct. So, as that is why I took very round numbers so that like we just uh, are looking at ballpark figures right. So, we get around 100 kilowatts. So, in other words you know like we need a power train that can essentially deliver a power of around 100 kilowatts to enable me to uh, meet this specification. Let us look at the complement right. So, now let us look at the brake. So, now Braking is the reverse 72 to 0. So, typically you know like most uh, vehicles depending on where we live you know like one important specification is 0 to x kilometers per hour in so many seconds, but uh, very few people talk about x kilometers per hour to 0 in so many seconds. So, let us talk about that. So, let us say we want to go from 72 to 0 let us say in 4 seconds obviously we want to this is the uh, what to say worst case scenario right what we call as panic braking right. One hopes that we do not encounter such scenarios, but that is how that is how uh, the design is done right. So, we can immediately see that the average deceleration of course, I do not need to do so many calculations because using the time scale itself you can figure things out, but then let, let us say we do it you know like the average deceleration is now going to be okay, average acceleration. Uh, is going to be this. So, you get a negative number minus 5 which in implies that the vehicle is decelerating. So, compared to a braking power if we calculate the same way right half m V f squared minus V i squared divided by delta t. Of course, let us say I am interested only in the magnitude right not the uh, sign per se. So, if you do the calculations you will see that the numerator is the same denominator is one fifth. So, the power should be 5 times. So, in a certain sense you know like uh, the brakes the energy or the rate at which the brake should extract the energy from the vehicle is more. But the only thing is that like which can be told to provide a balance to you the power train continuously when the vehicle is operated you know like you need the engine to continuously op be operated and provide the necessary traction right. But the, however, the brake is going to be operated only intermittently one hopes right and so that <coughs> this just gives puts things in perspective right. So, a 5 meters per second square deceleration uh, uh, where a stopping maneuver has to be executed in 4 second is not something which we will encounter uh, day in and day out hopefully right ok. So, just uh, these numbers just put things in perspective right. So, as far as the uh, uh, brake and the power train are concerned. So, essentially the brake system is pretty important because by and large for most road vehicles the peak accelerations and the peak decel <coughs> decelerations 
if you compare the va design values or the design specifications by and large the peak deceleration values are going to be higher than the peak acceleration values okay. So, so one needs to essentially be aware of the fact and ensure that we uh, come up with a break which achieves that in practice. So now let us articulate what are the functions of a brake system. So very intuitively we, uh, we understand what a brake system should do right because particularly uh, road vehicles are some things you know like are entities that you and I encounter every day. So we have an intuitive understanding but let us formally write uh, things down. So a brake should be able to decelerate uh, the vehicle and stop it when necessary. Okay. <coughs> this is one requirement of a um, brake system is it known. This essentially implies that <laughs> this should provide sufficient okay, brake force that is an important requirement is it not okay because in order to achieve a certain deceleration and stop the vehicle the brake system should have enough capacity to provide the necessary braking force right. Then a brake should also help us in maintaining the speed of the vehicle while travelling downhill. Okay. So, it should essentially help us in maintaining. See because when we are coming down the hill W sin theta s will essentially try to accelerate the vehicle right. So, the brake should be applied more often than not to ensure that the vehicle is uh, uh, what to say uh, kept at a controllable speed so that we can take turns and navigate the narrow roads when we come downhill right for a, from a hill for example right. So, this should imply that yes the brake should have enough capacity but if you look at friction braking what is going to happen the kinetic energy is converted to heat energy and dissipated. So, what is going to happen to the brake components their temperatures are going to get hot and we are dealing with friction material when the temperature of the friction material reaches high levels their friction properties go down right or decrease then we will not be able to achieve the design brake force or brake torque or the, and the vehicle deceleration that is expected. So consequently if one wants to meet this expectation the brake should be able to dissipate the heat energy effectively okay so that the temperature is maintained in reasonable levels right so that's important then <coughs> the a brake system should also be able to hold a vehicle stationary on a grade this is very important right so when well we are on a grade and due to whatever reason we park or we are waiting in traffic we should ensure that you know the vehicle does not roll down. So the brake system <coughs> should also be in a position to hold the vehicle stationary okay as and when design on a uh, gradient. So these are uh, some functions and we are going to see how these functions have been uh, realized in uh, uh, vehicles you know like shortly. Before that let us go and look at how did brakes evolve in 
in vehicles, friction brakes. See of course throughout this uh, module unless otherwise I explicitly specify when I use brake or braking we are dealing with friction brake and friction braking respectively okay. So how did uh, uh, brakes evolve? So initially what happened was that like wheels were braked the initial mechanism were all mechanical uh, were braked by wedging a shoe. against the rim. So what this means is that let us say you know like we have a wheel okay if you if you compare a horse driven carriage and so on right you have a wheel and typically what happens is that there is a brake shoe and that is essentially controlled by a lever which go which is under the control of the driver it goes up upstream and then the, when the driver actuates this lever this wedge is going to be pushed against the wheel and that generates friction. So this these were the initial mechanisms this was okay as long as we move to pneumatic tyres once we move to pneumatic tyres such a wedging mechanism on the periphery is not practical right because we can just apply pressure on the external surface of the pneumatic tyre if too much force is applied it may burst. So what happened people then looked at moving the brake mechanism into the wheel assembly. So from here we transition to what is called as an external contracting brake okay which is typically realized as what is called as a band brake. So what is this band brake? So just to have a simple schematic so we can immediately observe that. In a band brake, this is our uh, uh, what to say <coughs> rotating wheel, the blue entity. Then what happens is that a band is wrapped around the wheel, right? So sorry, the blue is not the wheel; it's the wheel hub. Okay, so this blue in colored cylindrical shape that you see there, right, is the uh, wheel hub. So the brake is moved within the wheel assembly into the hub, right? So essentially a band which we can see in green color is wrapped around it and on the internal surface of the band we have the friction material the pink color lining that you can see. So when the uh, brake is not applied you know like there is a small gap between the friction lining and the external surface of the wheel hub. Now when the brake lever is pulled this band is tightened right. So what happens? So this band contracts and then pushes the friction lining against the wheel hub and the braking torque is generated okay and the wheel is decelerated right okay. So that is why it is called as an external contracting brake. Why it is called external? Because the mechanism for braking is external to the rotating element and the band and the friction lining contract that is they come radially inwards when applied okay. So that is the band brake once again pretty simple right. What is the potential limitation of this band brake? One limitation which essentially affects the performance of this band brake is that we already have discussed that during this process of friction braking kinetic energy is converted to thermal energy. Now when these components get heated up what is going to happen? The band and also the wheel hub are going to expand right due to thermal expansion. Now when they expand what is going to happen to the gap between the 
friction lining and the wheel hub that will reduce. So, the friction lining may accidentally rub against the wheel hub even when there is no requirement. Of course, the band also needs to be carefully supported so that like even when cold the band uh, the friction lining should not rub against the wheel hub. Even if we address that problem during operation due to thermal energy uh, what to say uh, conversion of kinetic to thermal energy we are going to have this issue right. So, one limitation uh, is that the band may rub against the drum. So, we call this wheel hub or drum ok. So, ok against the drum uh, due to thermal expansion. So, that was one other require what to say next step. Now, <laughs> the idea that uh, people had to essentially solve this issue is that can we go the other way that is can the friction material expand from inside a drum and then like contact the internal surface of the drum rather than the external surface ok. So, that led to what is called as an internal expanding break ok what we typically uh, see as a drum break. So, so today uh, drum brakes are used along with uh, disc brakes as common friction brakes in uh, uh, road vehicles we will analyze both uh, in detail. But uh, the idea is to uh, have this sort of arrangement that is wherein we had the drum ok external to the friction uh, material ok. So, we can see these uh, brake shoe which is pivoted on a uh, backing plate right and when we apply a force on the free end of this shoe what happens is that this brake lining is then pushed against the uh, drum rotating drum right the drum is rotating along with the wheel. So, that is why it is called as an internal expanding brake ok. So, internal means uh, uh, internal represents the fact that the uh, brake shoe or the brake lining is inside to the drum and when the brake is applied it expands and then contacts the uh, internal surface of the uh, rotating drum right. So, that is the uh, drum brake. Of course, even this has issues right. So, we face uh, uh, what to say issues due to uh, thermal expansion right. So, in this case what happens is that like due to thermal expansion the gap between the lining and the drum will now increase right because the drum expands right. So, then what will happen is that we need to have more travel for the shoe to contact the drum and there are a few more issues ok which we will uh, discuss when we discuss both drum brake and disc brake. But however, this internal expanding brake is quite popular even today and from here we also have gone to what are called disc brakes where the displacement of this brake lining you know like is along the axis of the rotation of a wheel. We look at disc brakes in greater detail and so if you pictureize a rotor rotating between my two hands what is going to happen is that when the brake is applied the two if these two hands are the brake shoes or the brake pads they are going to move along the axis of rotation and then clasp the rotor from either side ok. So, that is the concept behind a uh, disc brake ok. So, the displacement is along the axis of rotation. So, we will analyze uh, we look at drum brakes and disc brakes uh, in greater detail uh, and then like we will uh, what to say uh, look at the uh, uh, 
what to say uh, various attributes okay. So that is in a broad sense you know gives us a picture of how did these friction breaks evolve with time right. 